All right, so um, I will start off with uh, the questions. Every candidate will have three minutes to answer each question. We're, we'll go in alphabetical order, but we'll sort of cycle through so everybody gets their chance to go first and last. Um, uh, so yeah, so you'll have three minutes to answer each question. Uh, I may have a follow-up, in which case you'll have 30 seconds to answer that. Uh, again, Sean Cotter, the Boston Herald. Um, I uh, don't work with any of these organizations, but I am. They submitted questions to me, and I uh, will say where the question came from, and then ask you the question. So um, let's get straight to it. This one was uh, originally from the Detectives Union, uh, but uh, all the different police unions uh, asked it. Um, the issue of defunding the police, um, just very simply, as a general concept, are you for it or are you against it? Oh, yeah, and so uh, we're, we're starting with uh, Mr. Barros. Sorry about that. Thank you, Sean. Um, I recognize, uh, want to recognize the hosts of uh, today's uh, forum. Um, all of the different organizations of law enforcement that have brought us together today. I want to recognize for their, for their services to our community, for uh, putting their lives on the line and um, helping protect us. Um, I've got family members in the, on the force and friends and um, proud of the Boston Police Department and what you guys have been able to do. Um, I, I think defunding police is the wrong framework. It is not the right framework to look at the work we need to do. We need a positive vision. We need a, for any department in the city of government, we need a vision that talks about how we can be better, do better, how we can aspire to be the best. Um, and uh, I'd like to talk about how Boston police uh, or all of our first responders can be the best department in the country. We were the first police department in the country. And in fact, I know we can continue to get better throughout the years that I've been a resident in Boston, I've seen the improvements. I've seen the changes. Um, you know, uh, there are changes that have been made. And in fact, we have a better police department for it. And I think there are more changes that need to be made so that in fact, we can continue to improve. But as I talk to members of the force, I, I don't get any disagreement on that. In fact, I think that, uh, you know, uh, this can only be done in partnership. And as mayor, I would make sure to be in partnership with any of law enforcement groups to, to seek the changes that we all want to see. I was proud to serve under Mayor Marty Walsh as his chief of economic development for the last seven years. And proud, in fact, to have partnered with police when we launched the Boston Police Reform Task Force. Um, and in conversation with police, came up with a great list of reforms, uh, a great list of things that we, some we had started and needed to do more of, and some we need to, um, to do and implement. Um, and so uh, it's important, in fact, that we go back to the list of things that we talked about there, that we finish implementing the Office of Police Transparency and Accountability, that we finish doing the work that we started with, uh, with body cams, that we do the work that we started to make sure that, in fact, the Boston Police Department continues to be uh, uh, ahead of the curve in our country and continues to be well positioned to serve the residents of the city of Boston. And so for me, that's the framework we should look at. It should be a framework about how we get better and how we become the best, not a framework around funding. Uh, thank you very much. Um, same question to uh, City Councilor Asabi George. Um, defunding the police, yes or no? Thank you very much for unmuting me there. I thought it'd be a, a little bit of difficulty getting my answer in. I'm grateful uh, for everyone who's hosted this afternoon's forum and this very important discussion uh, that we need to have together. When I think about the work, uh, let me first say I'm Anissa Asabi George and very proud to serve as an at-large city councilor here over the last five and a half years. I'm also excited to lead this city as its next mayor. And when I think about the work of municipal government, when I think about the work that we have to do together as a city, one of the most important aspects of city governance, of municipal government, and of your leader, of your mayor, is to make sure that we keep our city safe. Public safety has to be central to the work that we do. 
Now, I do not support defunding the police. I believe that we have to invest in our community programs that get to the root of injustices in our system and throughout our city. I know that chances are if any one of our residents ends up in the justice system, it's our other systems that have failed them along the way. We know the challenges that our residents face around housing, around transportation, around education, around access to healthcare. And when those systems fail, it continues throughout the span of their lifetime. And too often when these other systems have failed, our residents end up in the judicial system. We need to make sure that our police officers, our Boston Police Department, all of our first responders have the tools they need. And as a city, we need to invest in that work. We know that too often, many of you are responding to calls that go way beyond the scope of your work. So that's why we have to invest both in the work that's happening in our communities and in your training. We have to decriminalize poverty. We have to decriminalize substance use disorder and homelessness and mental illness. And that's stuff that we have to do at the city level and work with you in partnership to make sure that you're able to keep our city safe. And when we have these conversations around defunding the police, they're very directly related to the police budget. And it's no different here in the city of Boston. And as a city councilor today, we are undergoing our city's budgeting process as we do every year this time preparing for the next fiscal year. I believe we need to increase our police budget. And I think that, you know, it seems almost counterintuitive um, when, when we think about the larger uh, scope of the problem, but to actually work to decrease the police overtime budget, we need to increase in our police budget. We need to hire more officers. We know that our overtime budget is just an item that we constantly and consistently overextend ourselves. And to actually cut down on that spending, we need to invest in our police department. And through my work on the city council, through my work in partnership with community, and through my work in partnership with many of you, we've identified uh, a is, shortage uh, of at least three minutes. 300 police officers. And I look forward to the rest of today's conversation. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much. Um, same question goes on to uh, State Rep Santiago. Uh, defund the police, uh, yes or no? Great, uh, well, thank you, Sean. And let me start off by saying thank you to each of the first responder groups um, that have come together today to host this important forum on this very important issue. Again, my name is John Santiago. I am a state representative. I, I represent the South End primarily, but also stretch out to Roxbury, Back Bay, uh, parts of the Fenway as well. And like many of you, uh, I've committed my life to public service. You know, in addition to my role as a state representative on Beacon Hill, I still work the overnight shift as an ER doctor at Boston Medical Center. I still work with many of you on the front lines. And I'll see you Friday and Saturday overnights during my shift. And I still happen to be a captain in the Army Reserve. So my life has really been about public service and giving back, similar to, similar to what many of those people on that video we just heard what their life was about. So let me just say, as a fellow first responder myself, who's been through the ringer this past year, like many of you, uh, and who this past weekend in the ER worked with EMS, police, and fire literally to save lives, you, know, you have my utmost respect uh, and support uh, because I know the value you bring and the risk you take on. And you will continue to have that support should I be so lucky to be the next mayor. So I hope tonight is the first of many conversations we have because it's these type of discussions you know, although tough at times are ones that we need to be having um, because this is how we achieve progress and you know we bring uh, people together when it comes to defunding the police look you know we cannot continue um, to attempt to solve these complex issues of policing or what have you with three word sentences the world is not figuratively black and white right it's gray and it's filled with a tremendous amount of nuance and look there's no question that the murder of george floyd and was despicable uh, was a callous act and that those perpetrators should be held accountable. But no three word phrase is going to solve any issue. Um, and so, you know, while it's a time for racial reckoning, you know, and as a person of color who grew up in urban America, I get it, you know, but let's not paint, you know, every cop, every police department with a, a broad paintbrush, right? When it comes to police budget, budget, you know, I will create a budget that reflects our priorities and ensures public safety, first and foremost. You know, I wanna invest in you. I want to empower you to be the best police officers that you possibly can be. 
And look, I will be a fiscally responsible mayor. You know, I'm going to commit to looking at the entire BPD budget and streamline operations when we can and to make it more efficient. So yes, I'm about fiscal responsibility, but more so than that, I'm about empowering you because we got to make sure that you can guarantee public safety and provide the appropriate services that I know you do each and every day because I work alongside you Friday, Saturday night in the ER. And so I want to make your job easier. I want to facilitate that and I want to invest in you. And given that the morale is low, because I see it and hear it um, from you when I work uh, alongside you, given the increase in the number of 911 calls, given the increase in the substance use issues that we're having and the mental crises, I want to employ people and create innovative programs to take that off your load, right? Thank you. That's uh, three minutes. Thank you, Representative Santiago. Um, the same question to uh, City Council Michelle Wu. Uh, defund the police, uh, yes or no? Thank you so much, Sean. And thank you so much to everyone who worked hard to, to put this conversation together today. Uh, grateful for the chance to have a direct conversation and get into the details about a lot of issues that uh, we kind of read back and forth in the news, but um, get the chance to, to dive in today. My name is Michelle Wu. I've served on the Boston City Council as an at-large member for eight years now and have been humbled to represent every neighborhood, every community in our city as someone who deeply believes in city government because my family has experienced just how much it matters. Uh, I grew up as a daughter of immigrants and uh, have been navigating the barriers on behalf of my parents since I was very young, uh, language barriers, cultural barriers. And in my family, I share the story often that in my early 20s, as my mom was becoming a single mom, she was diagnosed with late onset schizophrenia. And I raised my sisters from the time they were 10 and 16 and have been a caregiver in, in that situation. And so my family has lived and walked the experience of so many in our communities of mental illness, of deep challenges of needing to understand how all the pieces fit together. And in my platform in city government, I've been grateful to have the chance to see just how much of a difference we can make if we confront our issues directly, if we build coalitions and bring people with different perspectives to the table. So in terms of this specific question, you know, we can't, we can't reduce change and the scope of change that we need to a simple slogan. We need a plan and we need to acknowledge the level of reforms that are necessary, not just for our city to be truly safe for every single resident, including our officers who are going out every single day and putting their lives on the line, but to ensure that we are recognizing the service that is being put day in and day out and that that is not marked by the scandals and the situations that have come out. Um, because of systemic issues that need to be addressed. And so I just want to note that, in fact, we have tried defunding the police already. Technically, last budget cycle, the budget for the police department was cut, and it was cut out of a sort of shell game of slashing the overtime line item budget. Right? That was not a, ever a realistic way to get to change. I believe we need plans to shift from a public safety alone lens to public safety and public health together to think about the services needed for individuals experiencing mental illness, homelessness, substance use, to think about the systemic reforms to our overtime system and others to get that budget under control so that we will be at a place where we recognize the hard work and public service of our officers, just as we do every city department, but also held to the highest standards as all workers of transparency and accountability. All right, thank you. Um, the next question comes from the Superior Officers Association, and it's uh, very much in that same vein. Um, many of you and uh, various politicians and, act and activists have talked about reimagining the police department. Uh, what does that mean to you? Uh, what would be your plans for change in a broad sense? Uh, what would you be trying to do as mayor? Uh, we'll start this time with, um, with uh, Councillor Asabi George and go down the alphabet from there. Well, thank you for the question. And what I'll do here so I avoid running over, set my own timer. I think it's really important that when we talk about reimagining and doing our work different as a city, especially as it relates to public safety, that we are certainly doing it together. I'm very proud 
of our city's acknowledgement and I, I guess our nation's acknowledgement around our model community policing efforts here in the city of Boston and, and truly to uh, continue with that uh, legacy and to look forward with that, we need to always make sure that through community policing that the community is engaged and our police department is engaged, our police officers, that those doing the work are engaged. When we reimagine, we can think about, and often, and through my work, we will reimagine how we can better train police officers, how we can look at new recruits and their academy training, how we can expand training for existing officer, officers and integrate developing theories and police reform perspectives into that work. We need to establish clear protocols for promotions and performance evaluation over the course of uh, someone's career in the Boston Police Department and making sure that through that time we are providing police officers with professional development and training opportunities uh, to improve their skill set and to improve their efforts on, on the street. Uh, Reimagining and re-engaging in this very important work of public safety also includes increasing diversity across our police department, and in fact, increasing diversity across all of our first responder agencies. That we're also looking, especially within police, to expand the cadet program. As we look to expand the number of police officers in the department, we have an opportunity to expand the very successful Boston Police Cadet Program that we have today. And we have an opportunity to do that in partnership with our Boston Public Schools. And in fact, when we think about recruiting across our city, we've got a tremendous opportunity to think about all of our first responder agencies and to do that in a collaborative way with Boston EMS and with Boston Fire in partnership. It is so important that we do this work uh, together, that we are, again, including diversity in that recruitment, that we are looking for multilingual um, first responders, that we are expanding educational incentives for officers, and that we are holding true to our commitment of treating you like the professional that you are. I am committed to a schedule of promotional exams too often uh, under the, the current state of affairs. Officers are waiting many, many years, in fact, up to seven years to participate in a promotional exam. We need to perhaps extend the promotion uh, prob probationary period before promotion and then shrink to two to three years, those promotional exams. That creates opportunities for a, a more engaged uh, police force and, and current rules and regulations and creates more opportunities for uh, development throughout your career. Thank you very much, and I uh, hear that you did set the timer for yourself, so <laughs> very good. Um, so now next to uh, uh, Representative Santiago, the same question, um, reimagining the police department is a phrase that I believe many of you have used, uh, many of the mayoral candidates. Uh, what does that mean to you? What would be changing under your mayorship? <clears throat> well. The first thing that I will be doing is meeting with the folks on the ground. You know, the lesson that I've learned in my experiences, you know, not just as an ER doctor on the front lines, not just as someone who's, you know, traveled the world and, and, and worked in communities abroad, is that the best ideas come from people on the ground that are doing the work. And look, you know, it is you guys that are putting your lives on the line to serve us. And so my very first week in office, you know, very first month in office will be dedicated to working alongside you to showing up and hearing your voices because you need to be at the table. You know, I need to get the best ideas from the ground and you're going to provide those great ideas. And from what I'm hearing in my conversations with cops and folks all around the city, you know, is that morale is down, right? You know, I see this as an ER physician on the front lines. Again, the growing toll that the mental health crisis is having, substance use crisis. You know, there are better ways to treat that than by sending a police officer, right? Now, I'm not talking about in cases where um, there is someone's life's in danger, uh, but I see every Friday, Saturday night I work, there will be officers who will bring in someone who is intoxicated or agitated, and I see the looks on their faces. They don't want to be doing that stuff, right? Nor were they trained to do that stuff, but they're called to do that, right? I think there are ways to reimagine, to come up with programs that can invite other experts, other people that are trained specifically to do that type of work, 
provide better care. And we have examples of that all across the country that, all, that not only saves money, but provides better care. And so I want the city's resources to be best and most appropriately used to address some of those issues that are more public health in nature. You know, I wanna reduce your demand that, that is put on police, EMS, and fire, and put us in positions to succeed. You know, listen, I also want a diverse police department. You know, I want the best trained officers and we're gonna be investing in that from day one. You know, and I'm also committed to really decreasing the reliance on overtime. And we could do that by increasing staff. And my conversations with cops, you know, we're several hundred uh, officers down. Today, we had a graduation, 94 graduated, but we need more. You know, we need to increase morale. And I'm committed to doing it as the mayor of Boston and working hand in hand. But I, that all starts with conversations with you on the front lines. And, and you having me, my commitment to show up and engage and listen and learn. Thank you very much. Um, the same question to Councillor Wu. Uh, talk about reimagining the police uh, force. Uh, what would that mean under you as mayor? Thank you so much. Um, you know, I think we are in a moment of time across our country and here in Boston where there's tremendous strain, but also tremendous opportunity to redefine the path forward. And for me, any reimagining across our departments and in some ways, especially as we're talking about public safety in this moment of a uh, national reckoning on systemic racism and, and a push to ensure that we are doing better by racial justice, that involves first and foremost, starting with trust, right? This is why I'm showing up here tonight. This is why I will always be committed to having direct conversations, even in the places where, maybe especially in the places where we disagree, so that that direct back and forth can happen. And I will always be honest about where I stand on, on those issues. For me, this stems from a place of personal experience as well. As I've mentioned, my mother lives with mental health challenges, and there have been moments in my family's life where that has been quite intense. Moments where in the depths of her paranoia and delusion, it has been very complicated. The police have been called multiple times on her. And so I know what it feels like for our residents who have experienced those moments of fear when public safety shows up, armed law enforcement shows up, and you are terrified of what might happen in that split second within that situation. And so I want to ensure that we are building trust and doing the connecting with our residents with the services that are needed in the ways that ensure we are directly delivering safety and health. We need to be proactive about focusing our resources and reimagining, rethinking what's possible to serve residents who are living with mental illness and substance use and homelessness, which make up a large part of the calls for service that you all are sent out to manage, even though you may not be equipped to do so, and even if that is not what residents are, are seeking in that moment. So it's about having the conversations and pushing hard with, in partnership with EMS, in partnership with uh, those who from a social work and, and mental health background and substance use and counseling to have a trained professional force where we are building trust in responding better to these instances where our residents need help and are in crisis in those moments. I also want to be honest that reimagining must mean accountability and building up trust with the public about our resources. Some of the headlines that have come out that have put Boston in the news about fraud, about the use of resources, are ones that we must necessarily address to build trust for the entire department. We need accountability metrics. So far, I'm the only candidate who has put forward a specific plan for how I would address contract negotiations. There's a lot more details in there, but there are ways that we can make it consistent, fair across the board with an objective discipline matrix and other ways that we can codify a shared sense of trust, a shared sense of fairness across the board. Thank you very much. Um, the same question to uh, Mr. Barros. Um, uh, Reimagining the police department, what would that look like under uh, you as mayor? Thank you very much. Um, you know, I think reimagining the police department uh, in the same way that I said it in my first question needs to come with a positive vision. We need to reimagine the best police department in the country. 
And then the only way we can do that is bringing all the stakeholders together to have the conversation about what's working and not working. And so I want to emphasize, in fact, my partnership with law enforcement to do that. In the conversations that I've had, I believe we need to, we need to start a new city-run safety um, and, health, and healthy communities agency, one with health and human services uh, professionals that will work closely with law enforcement, but will be a non-law enforcement response. The agency will be made up of professionals, highly trained on safety measures to respond to calls that I've heard time and time from police that, that are, are probably not responses that, uh, calls that police should be responding to relating to mental health, related to public health issues, substance abuse. When I come home and I find someone who needs help but happens to be knocked out right in front of my house, we should be able to make that call but have somebody else show up. When there is a child uh, who uh, might need some medical attention or a behavioral health specialist, we should have somebody who is trained, someone else to respond. Um, these professionals need to be equipped, in fact, to immediately connect residents with medical care, with mental health treatment, with emergency housing, with substance abuse treatment. All things that I know right now that our police officers do and that I'm trying, they end up trying to figure out. I've seen police officers be um, uh, extremely flexible and trying to connect people to, to these types of services. But this non -inform, uh, law enforcement agency should do the work closely with the Boston Police Department and then determine appropriate responses to 911 calls, coordinated with the Office of Service Recovery by the city, coordinated with the Boston Public Health Commission, coordinated with Boston Public Schools, coordinated with Boston Housing and the Office of, of Housing Stability. Um, this is something that I'm uh, 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 that would be done in partnership with police. The other piece is, you know, I believe we have some 900 or so shortage in police. When we were a city of 600,000 people, we had a police force of 2,400. Now as a city going on 750,000 uh, residents, we have a police, uh, police force of about 1,600. I remember watching the numbers during COVID every morning on an 8 a.m. call with the police commissioner and, and, and the chief. And we would, we would talk about uh, uh, the health of the police department, health of police officers, you know, COVID, COVID exposure. And I felt then that it was too thin. I've learned over the years that in fact it is thin. Just look at our overtime numbers. The only way we can address it is in fact by hiring more police officers, being true to diversity and being true to having local people on in the neighborhoods, in the city, work for our police uh, force. Thank you very much. Um, on to the next question. Uh, this one's about police details. Um, there's always a lot of talk about those. Uh, some people take shots at them in the headlines, but uh, what is your understanding of how they work in what ways, if any, would they change under you as mayor? Uh, we'll start with Representative Santiago for this one. Great. Uh, uh, thank you, Sean. I mean, my understanding is that the vast majority of details are privately play, paid. You know, we do know that the Boston Water Sewer Commission does pay, um, which is a city, uh, pays, this is public land, do pay for details. And, you know, we're committed to detail reform, but again, that starts with conversations you know, with the union first and foremost and 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 folks on the ground determining what level of services that they need and what i can tell you is that you know my experiences in talking with community members and sometimes they appreciate having that extra cop you know on the ground i mean just yesterday here i was walking in the south end i'm having a conversation with some people doing some campaign activities and um, there was an issue that happened in this and this d4 and a number of cops had to show up to the um area in, in very quick notice and I think there was a detail next door that was able to facilitate that very quickly. So my understanding is that the vast majority of them are uh, privately paid. Again, the Boston Water Sewer Commission does pay for those. That comes out of public money. Uh, but I think it's a conversation we have to have with the police force um, and with um, you know, citizens of, uh, of Boston. And I'm committed to having that. Uh, thank you very much. And so now the same question will go to Councillor Wu. Again, uh, I forgot to mention this question is from the Boston Police Patrolmen Association, um, but it is, uh, again, police details. Um, what's your understanding of how they work and in what ways, if any, would they change with you as mayor? Thank you. Okay. And I'm, I'm also trying to self-time. So if I'm glancing back and forth, it's because I'm trying to watch my timer. Um, so the, the way that our details work is that there's a 
request that comes out from a uh, usually a developer or, or a contractor doing some work, it gets to, assigned out uh, by staff in the police department. And then the city sort of fronts the money for that, right? Paying for the detail hours that are worked to our officers and that private business or, or entity um, reimburses the city for that, right? So there are a couple places where we need some reforms. One is that there are holes sometimes in the reimbursement part of it and just making sure we are not fronting the money and then not seeing that come back and having the appropriate mechanisms for accountability to these companies as well. Um, secondly, is that the way that the details are assigned is often, um, I, 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 as I understand, an individual staff position in individual um, precincts that are making that decision and, and doing that as a separate administrative job. There should be a way where we could think about from a technology capacity standpoint or another way to free up sworn officers to be uh, on the beat and thinking about how that process works as well. And then in general, we need to have a conversation about how we ensure that we're actually able to fill all of the requests that are available. Um, it cannot come. Right now there's there's a shortage of, of uh, details that are requested that have not been able to uh, be matched. And we have to be open to civilians and others uh, stepping in to participate as well. This is an area where my understanding and through many conversations with officers and others who have been involved in the system, it feels like from the you know, often your members perspective, um, my understanding is that it feels like a necessary part of supplementing income, right? And then in a lot of cases, maybe even a third of the annual income can come from this combination of additional hours and pay. Right? That is not necessarily sustainable from uh, you know hours worked and how exhausting what that means in terms of your ability to be fresh and, and responsive and just any human being's ability to uh, respond in situations like that. And so we need to unravel the financial component, the public need for, for uh, supervision when these projects are happening, which cannot be filled entirely with the system we have now. And then of course, the financial accountability piece when it comes back to how that funding is, is working step-by-step step, uh, between the city of Boston and the private entities. Thank you. Um, the same question now goes to Mr. Barros. Um, details, uh, your understanding of how they work and in what ways, if any, would they change uh, with you as mayor? Yeah, my, my understanding is that details are um, paid for, in the great great majority of details are paid for by the private sector. Um, usually people are on um, uh, utility jobs or they're, in, they're, they're uh, uh, part of a development project that's happening, a construction project or something of that nature. Uh, as John had said, there are some quasis like uh, water and sewer um, that end up uh, paying for details. But um, what I also know is that, you know, too many of our detail requests go unfilled. Um, and this goes back to this, the question of the number of officers that we have um, on the force. Um, we in fact have more uh, requests. I can't tell you as chief of economic development for the city of Boston, you know, uh, how many times I'd heard, I would hear from a developer or someone that, you know, they need a detail and, you know, how do I get it? You know, it should, we should be able to fill our details. Um, and, and, and have more uh, police officers to do that. Um, the other piece that's a, that, that's a problem is many of our uh, public residents, first and foremost, don't know who pay the details, and then um, they don't understand what the details should be doing. I would work as mayor with the Boston Police Department to better define what the details are doing and to make sure that there is consistency. Um, most details are not there to take care of traffic. Um, that is, that is, that, and, and in fact, uh, people get, you know, really upset if there's a police officer on the screen, on this, on this um, scene, um, and what they perceive as a traffic issue somewhere nearby, and the police officer is not handling the traffic issue. And so there's got to be better, better information, better education with the public in terms of what a detail is doing and not doing, uh, you know, uh, that helps people to feel better, in fact, about the performance of our police officers on, on site. Um, they have helped save lives. They have helped uh, catch criminals uh, because they've they've uh, they've been on site. 
Um, but I think we, I would like to work with the, the BPPA um, in the contract negotiations to better define and think about whether there is more they can do um, to help uh, uh, work with the mayor to help educate the public, in fact, on what they should be expecting from police officers. Uh, thank you very much. And so, um, uh, has City Councilor uh, Sabi George, have you answered this question? It has not gotten to you yet. All right, it's, it's your turn now. Uh, same question. Um, police details, how do they work? Would they change, if at all, um, with you as mayor? No, thank you. And I uh, just set my timer and appreciate the opportunity for us today, I think, and maybe perhaps because we're a little bit of a smaller group, we've got a little bit more time to answer these questions and an opportunity to truly get into the weeds when we think about the work that is in many ways left undone in the city of Boston in particular as it relates to uh, the work of our Boston Police Department and the work that our men and women do in our policing agency every single day and across all of our first responder agencies. And you know, certainly there's no exception when it comes to the conversation around details. And as mayor, I'm committed to reform around accountability, around the reimbursement challenges, streamlining the operations, and making sure that the fees that we're charging or the percentage that we retain in the police department truly does cover the costs of operating the detail office and that work. I appreciate that details, which are largely, almost, almost totally paid by the private sector, gives us as a city an opportunity to put more police officers on the street every single day. And the conversation around looking to hire a civilians, non-uniformed, non-sworn personnel to do that work does not create savings. I'm a believer in pay parity. And we also have to appreciate the legacy costs that come with hiring civilians to do this work. We need to look at ways to include retired police officers uh, to help supplement the needs for additional details on our streets. And we need to make sure that we're looking and thinking creatively and innovatively around other law enforcement uh, officers to participate in this as well. If we can't fill all of our details through the Boston Police Department and, and certainly right sizing the force will help, but we need to look and, and be creative around other efforts uh, to have other uniformed personnel, again, retired or other law enforcement agencies uh, working um, as, as details and, and appreciating and respecting the, the, the opportunity it presents the city, again, to have more police officers on the street and during their non-work hours. I beat my time up. You did, thank you very much. Um, the next question, um, a few of you have uh, sort of gotten at this already, but uh, do you believe that there's a staffing shortage in the department? If so, um, what do you intend to do about it? And if not, why not? Uh, the first person to start with this one is Councillor Wu. The, okay, now I'm unmuted. Um, I am eager for us to make sure that we're having the conversation about the right types of roles in the ecosystem of public safety and public health. Again, we need reforms to build trust with our safety and health citywide. And we need to make sure that we are meeting residents with the services that they need. That is training and professionals who can manage instances with mental illness, homelessness, substance use. And that is taking a hard look at the positions right now within our department that are being done by sworn officers, which could be civilianized, right? The, those who are tracking details or thinking about attendance or, or other roles, there are a good number of uh, positions that are immediately available right in those uh, uh, existing right now that could supplement the, the need or thinking about how to expand coverage. Um, and then I think overall, we need to be ensuring that the resources that we're putting in are not just thought about in a vacuum on their own, that it's very much connected to how it impacts the entirety of the rest of the city budget, and that when we are out in the streets, with our residents, we're not only making sure to have that geographic coverage, but connecting with the exact services that are needed in that moment. 
And so from a staffing perspective, I believe that that means creativity about how we are uh, uh, responding to crisis calls, how we are triaging those, creating a, a community safety force of individuals who are trained in uh, mental health and de-escalation and all these services we've been talking about, following the example and best practices of cities across the country that have already gone down this path and seen not only better connection with services, but more efficient use of resources and cost savings in many ways to the entire city budget that can be plugged right back in to community stabilization, youth development, and so many of the priorities that we are uh, currently feeling like are being pitted against what is happening right now. We need to be expanding that pie so that we're starting earlier in the pipeline and connecting with our residents before it gets to the point of needing to chase around and add accountability after the fact. Uh, so just to be clear, is there, do you believe that there's a staffing shortage or not? Hang on, let me try to unmute you. Thank you. Sorry, I, we seem to be unable to unmute ourselves in this forum. I apologize. Um, I believe we need to take a hard look at the positions that currently exist within the department, including those that are more administrative in nature that should be put up against the overall staffing needs. And there are a good number within that infrastructure that we should be thinking about redefining where the roles are and where they sit relative to uh, moving some responsibilities away from armed law enforcement into more of a public health led approach. And that is the right framework to be thinking about staffing overall. Thank you. Um, moving on to Mr. Barros, uh, same question to you. Do you believe there's a staffing shortage in the department? Uh, if so, what are you going to do about it? If not, uh, why not? I think Sean, I, I do believe there's a staff, staffing shortage in the department. And so I, I just want to be clear, uh, we used to have a bigger force when we were a smaller city at six at, at, at about 600,000 residents. We had a force of about 2,400. Now we're a city of about 750,000. We've got a force of about 1,600 or so, and it's just not enough. Um, we, we need to make sure, uh, even as we reimagine the role for police, um, I think there is a, there is a shortage, right? So we will, uh, bring in more, uh, trained professionals to handle different roles. We will, um, you know, uh, make sure police aren't in uh, uh, answering calls that, that perhaps they're not trained for or, or weren't meant to answer. Those are things that I am, I'm still committed to. But at the same time, I think we need to hire uh, police uh, officers and add them to the force. And as we do, we, need to, we will do it in a way where we are going to put an emphasis on local residents. We're going to do it in a way where we are going to put an emphasis on diversity. We will do it in a way where uh, we, in fact, will be will double down on training. We will double double down on making sure that the police have the support that they need as we grow um, as as a force. But I just want to say um, that I'm pretty clear that um, there's a staffing shortage. Thank you. Uh, next, that question now goes to um, uh, Councillor Asabi George. Uh, again, I, I think I forgot to mention this. This question is from the Superior Officers Association. Um, but yeah, question goes to you, uh, Councillor Asabi George. Uh, is there a staffing shortage? And if so, what would you do about it? No, thank you, Sean. And as um, I mentioned in some of my earlier comments, we are currently short, I'd say, 300 police officers. And in order to fulfill our commitment to connect, to improve, to connect our residents to services, to improve the quality of service that we provide as a city to respond to the needs, especially the, the public safety needs in our city, to prevent uh, crime and violence, to investigate, to, to solve, and to help our residents across the city of Boston, we need to increase the number of police officers across the board. And that is a way to get more police officers out and about, engaged with our communities, engaged in the work of public safety, and engaged in the efforts around community building and rebuilding and community policing uh, to truly be engaged in those efforts. I think we also have to pay very close attention, very, very close attention to the, the pending crisis that we have here in the city of Boston with uh, a tremendous increase in the number of retirements 
that are coming uh, that have that have happened, especially over this last year, and the many more retirements that we have coming down the pipeline. We know today we celebrated a graduating class of almost 100 new police officers that will now be working in our neighborhoods and across our city, but that still is not uh, keeping up with the pace, both of retirements and, and then we think about uh, the number of police officers who are out injured right now. We have to respond uh, to, the, to the tremendous need uh, to keep our city safe and to do it in a responsible way. And we only can do it in a responsible way when we have an appropriately sized force. Thank you. Um, the same question to Representative Santiago. Um, is there a staffing shortage? And if so, uh, what would you do about it as mayor? Uh, thank you, Sean. The answer is yes. Um, I absolutely intend to make sure we have enough officers to do the job, you know, and we need to hire not just officers, but those ancillary services, you know, whether, you know, some of us have spoken about today, and I made a reference in a prior question with uh, related to the increase in substance use and mental health services, you know, we need to hire more officers. But again, we need to hire more ancillary services and people who can do that type of job and who can provide more appropriate care. And look, I see the growing toll of this. Uh, I live a block from Mass and Cass. You know, I work at the emergency department down there. There has been an increase in the crime and, and, and folks preying on people with substance use disorder there. And that's why on my mass and cast plan, I propose putting a new substation there to really address the growing rates of crime there that are preying on sick individuals. And look, it's not just substance use and mental health. You know, we are about to enter this period in Boston where the weather's getting better. People are leaving uh, and coming out of social isolation. There will be an increase, an uptick in gun violence this year and stabbings. And listen, the domestic violence trauma, that stuff doesn't just go away. You know, we need officers protecting our residents. That is the primary job and the first and foremost priority of the mayor of Boston, because everybody deserves to sit on their front porch and enjoy a, a nice summer's day. So yes, I believe in hiring more officers. And from my conversations, it sounds like we're down anywhere from two to 300. And today, you know, congratulations to the, I think it was 94 folks who've just graduated um, and uh, welcome to the force. Uh, but we need to get real serious about our overtime issue. And that's gonna require bringing in more cops. You know, because um, we don't need to be requiring existing cops to work 90 plus hours a week. That is a lot of time. And that is a lot of hours where they can, I'm sure they'd rather be at home with their families and taking care of their loved, loved ones. You know, we can improve the service. We can save money if we hire more. And I think it's an excellent opportunity to really increase and diversify our, our, our force and hire local residents. And as mayor, I'm dedicated to doing that. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is a two-part question from Mamlio, uh, the Massachusetts Association of Minority Law Enforcement Officers. Um, first off, how will you promote diversity in staffing? And uh, secondly, what are the diversity targets and how do you believe the force is doing? Uh, I believe we're back up to the top. Uh, Mr. Barros, you will start us off here. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate the, uh, the question from Nam Leo. Uh, so I think diversity uh, starts with recruitment. Um, we need to have, um, you know, when I ask my nine-year-old son what he wants to be, who he wants to be, it's, it's he wants to be a police officer. Um, it's just, that is his answer. Part of that is his cousin um, was, uh, was just, just came out of the academy and is now part of uh, the police department. And he sees that, he sees him, he's he, it's a part of our family. Um, and so our young ones need to be able to have relationship with the force, see the see, see our first responders, all of our first responders, all of our um, um, uh, law enforcement agencies around. And so making sure that, that we give them that exposure, whether they have someone in their family or not, they should be introduced in a positive way and it should be relationships. I'm a big fan of PAL, I'm a big fan of the uh, Police Athletic League and, and the work they do there. I'm a big fan of of what police officers do on their own, whether it's tennis or some of the work that they do in reading in schools and, and, and things like that. Um, as mayor, I will make sure that we have more resources and more ability, ability for police to do that. The cadet program is a super important program. Um, it is, um, uh, it's, in, it's incredibly important that we continue it. It's, it's incredibly important that we continue to, to work with the cadet program um, uh, to strengthen it. Uh, because it allows us to uh, uh, diversify the pipeline. It allows us to make sure that that we can be local. Um, and then I think, you know, it's important that we work together to highlight the good things that police are doing. I'm hearing, you know, uh, I just talked to a sergeant today 
who continues to talk to some of the people um, on, you know, uh, some of the police officers around him about morale. Um, and so if, you know, if we continue to, uh, you know, once again, you know, only talk about the deficits and what we're going to take away, it's not the right frame. The right frame is having a vision statement that says we are going to work to have the best police off the best police department in the country, the best public safety system in, the, in a city, and um, that's what people are going to want to be part of. People are going to want to be part of something that is positive, something that is forward-looking. And, and as mayor, I'd want to make sure that we change that narrative when we get there. Zero tolerance on bad behavior, high high uh, standards. Our police officers are for that. Transparency around it, accountability. Our police officers are for that. And we shouldn't be afraid of that, and we should be able to tout the things that we do well so that we can recruit and make sure that we can diversify and make sure that we can stay local. Thank you. Uh, the question now goes to Councillor Asabi George. Um, again, uh, how would you promote diversity in staffing? Uh, also, what are diversity targets and how do you believe the force is doing currently? Thank you. We, um, all of our forums, colleagues know uh, Astro the dog usually makes a, an appearance at some point and, and there he is. When we think about diversity in the Boston Police Department in particular, but across all of our first responder agencies, we have to understand the role that recruitment plays in that diversity, the role that retention and efforts around retention plays in increasing that diversity, the role and the, the, the critical place that professionalism plays in that diversity, as well as the opportunity for leadership and career paths forward. Um, those all impact the growing diversity and the need and the ability to have a more diverse workforce. It's so important for true community policing um, that our police department reflects the communities that it serves. And that's certainly a conversation around racial diversity. It's a conversation around uh, ethnic diversity, it's a conversation around language diversity, and a conversation around gender diversity. Although we are improving our numbers uh, for sworn police officers across the board, we still have many gaps in representation, especially when it comes to our specialized units, when it comes to leadership positions, and when it comes to command staff. We need to do better and we need to do that work together. I'm committed to increasing that diversity across the department and that's around those efforts of recruitment. That's around those efforts around uh, working to retain. And when we think around the, about the conversation around professionalism, we need to encourage Bostonians, our city's residents, our city's young people to see a reflection of themselves in the workforce. And when we retain and treat our police officers across the board with a certain professionalism, that is reflected in the community and the community then will better engage in exploring career opportunities. We have to, as I mentioned before, expand the cadet program. We have to partner with the Boston Public Schools in order to do that in a really thorough and thoughtful way. We need to work with our vocational school, Madison Park, Voc Tech School and our local colleges to uh, recruit young people to explore careers in policing. We need to increase the applicant pool and that's one of the most difficult things uh, right now in policing nationwide and it's no exception here in the city of Boston. We need to make sure that our young people see the possibility of them in policing, that they see opportunities again for career advancement in policing. And for me, a really important piece uh, as mayor creating true educational incentives uh, for all police officers. A, it is important to make sure that we have a highly skilled and highly trained workforce. And that can include education that is not directly related to criminal justice or policing. As mayor, I'm committed to working in partnership with our police department, with our police unions, to make sure that we are recruiting highly uh, talented, and excited uh, city residents to explore careers in policing and, and make a lifetime out of it. Thank you very much. Um, the question now goes to Representative Santiago. Uh, how would you promote diversity in staffing and also what are targets and how are we doing? Uh, thank you, Sean. Yes, um, you know, I will definitely fight for more diversity across the first responder spectrum. And, and look, and it's not just the first responders, it's any municipal agency or department that I will oversee as mayor. 
I mean, it must reflect the community it serves. I can tell you that in my experiences as a frontline provider, you know, at home and abroad, you know, if you have people who look like you, who share common cultural values, who, who might share language, you will get better care and you will get better services. This isn't me just saying this. This has been borne out in study after study uh, from my own personal experiences. And look, you know, we know diversity has increased, you know, but there's still more to do. And the first thing I will do is I work hand in hand across the board with BPD, with the unions and with the Civil Service Commission to increase diversity across the board, you know. Um, and I believe each of those institutions have an important role for that. And those are the first people I will meet with, sit down with, and have a conversation about this, is how can we do this together? And again, this is not just about race and gender, right? This is a, about making sure that our homegrown residents, you know, have the opportunity to become the next crop of first responders. And so I'll explore things like perhaps extra points for BPS graduates, really looking into cadet programs. Um, you know, we know that that has resulted in an increase in people of color uh, joining first responder units. But let me just reiterate, this will be done in conjunction with all stakeholders, you know, including people on this very uh, phone call right now. Um, there's a way to come together to really advance this mutually shared goal of diversifying our force. You know, it cannot be done in a vacuum. And I'm committed to bringing everyone to the table uh, in these conversations. So with respect to diversity targets, you know, that's again, working with Mamlio to see what they want to, to hear what their concerns are. And um, because again, the best ideas come from people on the ground and looking forward to really elevating the voices of stakeholders to make sure that, you know, I can implement and facilitate their best judgment. Uh, thank you very much. And now the question goes to Councillor Wu. Uh, same question, how would you promote diversity in staffing and also what are diversity targets and how do you believe the force is doing? Thanks, Sean. Um, I, th I think we also, we're all old hands at this, so we can basically take the question once at the beginning, I think, and, and each one, but I'll, I'll, I'll let my colleagues speak for themselves too. Um, I would say the police department, as every city department, should be reflective of the population and demographics of our city, that we want targets that reflect our Boston neighborhoods so that each community, uh, and as so many of my colleagues have said before, that our young people see themselves reflected in and feel connected to all of our city workforce. Uh, so I support efforts that Memlio has been leading in terms of ensuring that we are um, increasing the, trying to increase the residency, the length of residency that would factor into preference for joining the force to expand the cadet program to, you know, as, as we have moved beyond uh, a, a racially discriminatory promotional exam. Um, I support efforts to ensure that we are thinking about promotions outside of just the uh, simple tests and to take into account other factors that could be that are very relevant to ensuring that we are serving the community um, and to and to continue building opportunities for multilingual residents to join the force. But the bottom line is that if we want these roles to reflect our community, we want our community to want these roles. We need to make these good jobs that have a good standard of living. Uh, there's tremendous stress and a high incidence of mental health and um, physical health issues because of uh, various dynamics, long hours that are worked per week. We need to solve the systemic issues that are making it difficult for the officers who are working very hard every single day to serve the community, who feel that there is a, an ongoing gap and mistrust from the community because of the nature of the system. So to get us to the point where we, the, where the entire community sees this as a job that would be healthy, helpful, productive, connected to community, we do need to build back that trust, resolve issues around accountability in terms of how we're using our resources and overtime, ensure that we are um, implementing what I have put forward an objective discipline matrix which would guarantee consistency across the board as discipline for um, offenses or other actions have been carried out so that there's not racial bias or favoritism injected in the treatment of particular officers relative to each other. And to ensure that across the board, we are, again, reimagining, redefining how our officers are serving the community so that we see that value and that partnership. Thank you very much. Um, and so the next question uh, comes from the uh, Boston Police Patrolmen's Association. 
Um, there's been some talk, uh, in particular last year on the city council, about um, making police contracts public policy documents and sort of looking to shift some of the uh, bargaining away from the mayor and involve the council more. Uh, would that happen if you were mayor? Uh, we'll start with, uh, I believe, Councilor Asabi George is the first up this time. Uh, there you there go. We go. Uh, and thank you for the question. And certainly this is an ongoing uh, discussion at the city council and eventually in partnership with the mayor's office. Those conversations are important ones to have and those policy con uh, contracts as policy documents topic areas are ones that have actually encouraged the city council and created for the city council an opportunity to discuss some of these uh, details in, 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 in greater detail. For example, through those hearings, we've talked about the role of uniformed uh, police officers in more administrative roles. And through that, I've learned how that actually plays a really important role in policing. And then that's something that we actually should embrace and make sure that we are creating those opportunities for police work to happen in different ways and, and in those administrative ways. So although I am grateful for that, those conversations around the policy documents that are before the city council today, and it has kept us under the leadership of a few of my colleagues, it has kept us engaged in some of those details and in deeper understanding of your work. I don't believe that they should impact the contract negotiations, the contract negotiations between a union and a mayor and a negotiating team is one that I hold very sacred. I am a former union member as a former teacher in, in Boston, a member of the Boston Teachers Union. And we need to make sure that we have an, an ability to openly through our uh, appropriate protocols and processes, uh, fully negotiate contracts here in the city. So I won't sign those as your mayor, but I do think the discussions that are happening around those topic areas are very important ones for us to have and have helped, I think, in many ways, the city council and members of the city council more fully appreciate the work that happens every single day by the men and women of the Boston Police Department. And uh, just to be clear on that, so would you support making it a public policy document or not? Here we go. I think I made it very clear I would not. Thank you. Um, and so the same question to uh, Representative Santiago. Um, thank you, Sean. Um, listen, the buck stops with the mayor, you know, when it comes to the police department. It is the mayor that appoints a commissioner, it is the mayor who is tasked uh, with ensuring public safety, and therefore it should be the mayor, uh, not the city council that negotiates the contract. You know, involving the city con uh, council, in my opinion, would bring too many cooks into the kitchen. You know, the city council currently has a role. Their role is to ratify the agreement. Um, morale is low right now. You know, trust is eroding. You know, we need a collective bargaining apparatus that uh, will allow for the least amount of politicization. And I don't think increasing the city council's role in that will help matters. So as mayor, you know, my team will be leading the negotiation. Uh, thank you. Uh, the same question to Councilor Wu. Thank you very much. As mayor, I will be the one negotiating the contract and ensuring that the city's team is um, working to settle items across the table with each one of our bargaining units in terms of our municipal employee, our public employee unions. But I want to emphasize that regardless of whether each one of us as candidates says that we support a contract as a public policy document or not, it is a public policy document. Our contracts with our city unions very much reflect the values of each administration and whether we are living out what we say when it comes to fair wages and working conditions and all of the terms that are in there. As mayor, I would create a chief of worker empowerment whose job would be not only to think about how we interface with various parts of workforce development and training and industries outside of City Hall, but to also be in charge of making sure that we live out those values through our contracts, which are public policy documents in City Hall. 
That means we would seek not to let contracts expire, right? As of June 30th, the police union contract will be a year expired. We should not be having those lapses. We should be sitting and at, at the table trying to get those done. But that requires transparency as well. I, as mayor, will not be afraid of being public about what the issues are and how we can strive to get them done together to involve the general public, to involve the city council in helping to have a conversation about what's important for our city, not in the you know day-to-day -day of, of the negotiations back and forth across the table, but to make sure that we are opening up the, um, the power that the city has to change dynamics with every part of our policymaking process. That's through budgets, that's through programming, and that's to ensure that our contracts also reflect those values. Um, I have put forward a very specific plan for how I would approach contract negotiations with the Boston Police Unions. So that is up on my website. It's michelleforboston.com. It includes pieces of what I would put forward as major priorities, pieces that I believe we need to seek deep changes on embedded into the contract, and also pieces where I believe we can move to a different system that would create a framework for greater trust and greater transparency in how we're, we're building this relationship between public safety, public health, and our community. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, same question to Mr. Barros. Thank you very much, Sean. You know, I think it's really important that we're clear on the contract being something that is negotiated um, by the BPPA and the other unions um, and the mayor. Uh, it is something that should be negotiated by those who are working about their working conditions, about their job, about their dignity, about their pay and, and, and what they deserve. Uh, but it needs to be informed by a public discussion. In fact, it is informed by a public discussion. The public is already discussing it and pushing and people are clearly engaging about what policing should be. And, and, and I think it is to the benefit of both the mayor and the police force to have conversations about policing, whether in city council or different hearings. Um, it's important so that when we hear, in fact, that people want to see more diversity in the command staff or that people want uh, more local uh, uh, residents of Boston uh, to be on the police force, that, that in fact, we're talking together about maybe how the contract might be an instrument to make that happen. It is really important that we, uh, we allow ourselves to be part of that public conversation so that we can build trust and relationship and confidence in the in the police department and uh and, and in what we're trying to do but let me just be clear sean um you know uh the men and women of the police department uh have the right to collectively bargain um and they have the right to collectively have conversations about um uh their work their works the, the the their workspace um their pay their benefits in a way that is not infringed and um, and 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 negotiated in public, um, I think it would be unfair. And I think that every mayor and me as mayor would be responsible to sitting down and talking about point to point with the different negotiation teams and my team and make it a fair conversation and not one that is mirrored by a lot of different conversations held in 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 in, in hearings. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the next question comes from the uh, from Boston EMS Union, and um, so they uh, the Boston EMS contends that because of the lack of permanent infrastructure dedicated to EMS units, ambulances are forced to post at street corners uh, for the entirety of their shifts. Uh, therefore, EMTs and paramedics are often sitting and running ambulances for eight to 16 hours a day. Uh, what what would you do about this? What can be done about this? Uh, I believe Representative Santiago takes this one first. Great. Um, I've gotten to know over my six, seven years working at Boston Medical Center, the folks at EMS pretty well. You know, they bring in patients to me, um, whether it's heart attack, stroke, or what have you. And they're on the front lines, particularly this past year, they have been dealt with a crisis and they have responded honorably, uh, admirably, and have gotten to work. And they're right. In some respects, you know, they're not having the same parity when it comes to other first responders. I mean, you talked about some of the, the lack of investment that has been afforded to them, um, but we can also talk about the lack of, of pay parity, right? You know, it's my understanding that they make about somewhere about 60% of what 
uh, police and fire make, generally speaking. So, you know, I am absolutely 110% dedicated to ensuring that these folks who put their lives on the line, who save people's lives each and every day, get the compensation and the investment and resources that they deserve, because I know their value. And so working hand in hand with them to see how we can alleviate the stress, um, address any issues with respect to uh, a lack of resources, you know, whether it's the trucks, whether it's the stations, um, again, facilitating their job. That is my role as the mayor of Boston, to honor, to respect the value that they do, to increase their parity. And EMS will have a partner in me. I'm committed to doing that because I know the value that they bring, uh, particularly this past year. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the same question to Councillor Wu. Thank you, Sean. I just want to start by really lifting up our first responders across the board have been working nonstop at tremendous risk throughout the pandemic. Our EMTs and those in EMS have continued nonstop to be saving lives continuously. And so just I want to make sure to name the strain, the ongoing effort that and, and sacrifice that has been put in there. And we know that this is already picking up before COVID-19 as well, as our opiate crisis in Boston has intensified and the number of lives that have been saved as our ambulances and EMTs are deployed to situation after situation with, with the opiate crisis as well. Um, when it comes to facilities, we need to be leaning on all of our uh, large development projects where in the places where there are gaps as well as our existing hospitals to make sure that everybody is contributing to this part of supporting the public, right? There are some great partnerships that exist. Um, some of our large hospitals have been wonderful about creating space and creating the facilities and making sure that ambulances can stay there. And then there are big gaps in other parts. We still are urgently needing to find space in the seaport, for example. We still know that the ambulance just stays parked in Franklin Park and there are other gaps across the city. And then even where, when we have existing facilities, there are some places where the bays that were constructed do not fit the ambulances of today. They can't even go all the way in uh, or the spaces that our EMS staff are in are not heated or cooled or have the, the proper um, healthy conditions as they're waiting to go administer health and save lives for other people. And so this is an issue that we need to keep going at the really at the, the ground level to do a facilities audit to understand what the conditions are and how to fill these gaps urgently. It should be part of every conversation with new development in the seaport to find that place where we can house our uh, facilities and the ambulance and team and then also to lean on the uh, existing hospitals to make sure that we are able to accommodate our growing population, keeping response time low, um, and at a minimum guaranteeing that there are viable facilities available for, for EMS across the board. Thank you very much. Uh, the same question to Mr. Barros. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, you know, I think uh, EMS uh, being one of the three uh, emergency service agencies that respond to 911 calls need to be given the infrastructure and the support that they need uh, to answer those calls on time uh, to bring the professional services that are needed for emergency calls. I think at this point there are 16, I believe, uh, stations uh, uh, throughout the city of Boston, um, 26 uh, ambulances, and I think uh, there's no question we need to add to the um, quality of infrastructure and expand infrastructure. There are certain parts of Boston, if you look at a map, if I remember correctly, that there were gaps. Um, I think uh, there was only one one station close to West Roxbury, another one in Hyde Park, and you might argue that that, that southern part of the city that, that we need some more. And then there were some other gaps. And I think we need to look at um, where people go um, to, and, and to, for, to, in order to respond to their service areas. There's got to be better places uh, beyond stations that they can, that they can, that they can uh, wait, and there's got to be better uh, ways to do that in, in between calls. Uh, so as mayor, I just want to say I, I, I am committed to um, expanding and improving the infrastructure for EMS. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Asabi George. There we go. You know, I think it's so important that we are always exploring ways to in, in continue to invest 
in our infrastructure across the city. And certainly when we think about the work of our EMTs, of our first responders, we know that they are so much more than just ambulance drivers. And we need to treat them with the professionalism and the courtesy that their role in our city, their life-saving role in our city uh, plays here today. So for sure as mayor, I'm committed to uh, a continued funding and investment in those capital improvements, whether it's the ambulance bays or in our facilities. And we think about where EMTs are currently trained, that their facility for their headquarters, uh, well below standard, and we need to improve that. And when we make those improvements, when we make those investments, both in our facilities, but by extension, in the men and women of Boston EMS, we improve our response to health emergencies across our city. We strengthen the work and the ability to deliver high quality care to the residents and the visitors here in the city of Boston. We need to also be very thoughtful and creative about how we can use our infrastructure, both our built environment, our assets, and the men and women delivering the services every single day to deliver care in a creative way. And I am committed to work in partnership with the men and women of Boston EMS to make sure that they have the tools, the equipment, the built environment in order to best serve and help and assist our residents who are almost always when they call 911 looking for that ambulance driver, looking for that EMT or paramedic. They are looking for help and in their moment of need, we need to make sure that we have first class, uh, high quality response to that call. Thank you very much. Um, the next question uh, comes from the whole group of unions. Um, uh, would you, as mayor, uh, honor binding arbitration? Uh, if not, what is the alternative? What's the strategy or goal for getting contracts worked out? I believe uh, Councillor Wu starts with this one. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to set my timer. Thank you so much, uh, Sean, for or, or to the, all the unions for this question. Um, I am uh, an attorney. I very much want to ensure that we have due process across the board. Um, and I am a firm believer in collective bargaining and the process for ensuring that we are supporting workers across every municipal bargaining unit. I have put forward a uh, plan, again, on how I would handle contract negotiations, where I believe we need to explore changes to how we currently handle this. It eats away at the relationships between the public and the city and the police department. When we see instances of individual officers who have a particularly intense disciplinary history, who have committed certain offenses, who have not been able to be removed from the force. That affects every single officer when those cases happen and when they come to, to light. And even when they don't come to light, the general feeling of the public uh, when interacting with our department. And so we do need to have a serious conversation about how to handle those most intense offenses and whether we set a threshold for what goes to arbitration and what does not. Um, but again, I've put out a lot of details on this in my plan and look forward to ensuring that we are embedding this in the ongoing contract negotiations, which are uh, a year expired now and up for the potential for major changes to be embedded and set the tone for a, a very different next phase of what's happening in our city. And so that is... Uh... Is that just a yes or no on uh, binding arbitration? Is that something that your administration would uh, continue to uh, respect? We need to have a conversation about exploring the specifics through the contract negotiation process. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Barros, the same question to you. Hey, Sean, uh, just thank you. Uh, um, am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can Thank you for uh, for the question. The yeah, binding arbitration is is what we all want to um, um, be able to use, right? It's, it's what we want it. We want to be able to have a process that's clear. Here's we're gonna we're gonna negotiate. Here's how we're gonna negotiate. And if we can't come to an agreement, arbitration, and we we want it to be binding. But you know, we do have to leave the ability to uh, continue to negotiate. Um, continue to have those conversations. And so 
Um, although that is what we're going to aspire to, the Barrows administration uh, will will want to, in fact, um, uh, believe, in fact, that we can get to the point where, through arbitration, we will, in fact, uh, come to a, a, a mutual agreement. Um, I was part of an administration uh, that had a great record uh, with uh, under uh, Mayor Martin J. Walsh, who is now our Secretary of Labor, um, and I believe I can keep that record up where we will work with all of our bargaining units um, across the uh, city and get to a point where we, if we have disagree disagreement and we need to go to arbitration, we will use it to move forward. And so the same uh, clarification, is that a yes or a no on uh, going with what the binding arbitration comes out with? That, that is what we would like to do. Uh, same question to uh, Councillor Asabi George. Thank you, Sean, for the question. And uh, my fellow candidates on uh, this platform today will appreciate uh, this here, which is ready for our forum that's happening after this one. As a core value of mine, we have to, and I will, as your mayor, uh, support the agreements that come out of binding arbitration. But also as your mayor, in partnership with our unions, we need to be in a place where we are able to negotiate with each other in good faith before we hit um, a need to go to that arbitration. That's really important to me. And another goal of mine as mayor and a commitment I will share with all of the unions present today and the many unions uh, that, are rep that represent the workers across the city of Boston is that we get to a place where we are negotiating contracts prior to their expiration. The fact that we now have contracts that have expired and will expire again until the last one is settled is irresponsible. It's irresponsible government. It's irresponsible when we think about the partnership that should exist between government, between the city of Boston and her employees. Uh, this is uh, very important to me as a former union member. And it's something that I'm very much committed to as mayor of this city. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's to you, Representative Santiago. Um, thank you, Sean. Um, let me just be very clear. As mayor, you know, I will ensure um, that the Boston Police Department is adhering to guidelines put forth in, in the contract that is created and agreed to by all stakeholders, right? I mean, this is fundamentally about providing fair uh, due process for all the individuals. You know, we are a country of laws. We are a city of laws, and therefore we need to act as it. You know, when it comes to disciplinary actions, you know, I hear the concerns, but I want to make sure that above all else, you know, that, you know, all parties involved are provided that due process, you know, for each and every one. I um, mean, make no mistake, we will hold people accountable should they break the public trust. But I believe that, you know, uh, the platforms put forth in the contract that once it's agreed to and agreed to by all stakeholders that we should adhere to them. Uh, thank you very much. Um... So um, back to the police unions, uh, this question was from uh, both the detectives and the Patrolman's Association. Um, there has been a lot of discussion lately about the city's plainclothes units, primarily the gang unit. Uh, some favor disbanding the units. Uh, others say they're crucial for cutting down on violence in the city. Uh, where do you stand with the gang unit and other plainclothes units continue to exist under your administration? I believe we're back up to Mr. Barros to start this one off. Thank you. Um, so, you know, whether the gang, uh, the gang unit or the plain clothes unit, um, those units are better when they are in partnership with community. Um, as the executive director of the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, um, when we were in partnership with our units on the ground, units in our neighborhood, um, we had better results. And so as mayor, um, I would ask for the, for us to continue that work, to continue to make sure that the, the gang unit and, you know, the gang unit in this area runs right down the street from me. Um, and I know those guys very well and the gals and, and the gang unit, but, but it is better when they are working in partnership with community-based organizations, 
They're working in partnership with neighborhood associations and making sure, in fact, that people understand what they're doing, that um, they're getting, uh, 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 the relationship is reciprocal and they can share information and get information. And so as me, I would emphasize that for our plain clothes officers and gang unit. And so to be clear, that would continue to exist uh, if you were mayor. The only way we can have partnership, they got to exist. Uh, thank you. Uh, City Councilor uh, Sabi George, that question's to you. Uh, thank you very much for the question. And it's, it's a topic that many of us have spent a great deal of time discussing. I am a proponent of maintaining the gang unit, the youth, youth violence strike force, and certainly look for ways to improve both their practices, which I know because I've met with many of them um, who are performing this work every single day. I've also met with community members who are very much interested in the work of the gang unit around the best practices, the way that we can improve the services and improve uh, the quality of work that they do every single day. Uh, protecting our city and making sure most specifically that we are getting guns off the street. That is one of their main functions and it is an important tool. Uh, they are an important resource when it comes to the work of keeping our city safe, keeping our residents safe from harm and limiting the number of violence, the, the amount of violence, especially around uh, shootings that we see here in the city of Boston. There has been a tremendous increase, especially over this last year in gun violence and gun shootings. And we need to work in partnership with those specialized units that are doing this work day in and day out and certainly work in partnership as well with the community. When we talk about community policing, uh, our specialized units aren't exempt from that. And they play a really important role in continuing their engagement with community. And it is just this weekend, I was at a, a tournament uh, in our city in which the gang unit was there present, engaged with our young people, engaged with community. We need to see more of that across our city. And as mayor of this city, I will demand more of that, but do it again in partnership. It's so important that we have those that are doing the work uh, present for these discussions and involved in it. Thank you very much. Uh, the same question to Representative Santiago. Um, thank you, Sean. Uh, as someone who has been on the front lines um, when it comes to violence in our city, I know firsthand uh, how gang violence impacts our community. You know, I've personally treated countless number of people who have been shot, you know, some of which who have passed away. And regardless of their gang affiliation, you know, I'm going to do my best to save their life. And sometimes I can't. And some of the toughest conversations I've had or with those families, you know, telling them that their loved ones passed and didn't make it. And so those stories stay with me. They don't disappear as soon as I leave the ER. You know, they resonate with me. And unfortunately, you know, it's on the rise. You know, we just had one of the worst years across this country when it comes to shootings. And my guess is that this summer will be a rough one, you know. And now in Boston, it's my understanding that gang violence is perpetuated by a small number of individuals, you know, who disproportionately drive violence in our city. And it's important that we have the tools and capabilities to respond appropriately. So I think the gang database does play a special role in that. You know, I do think we should reform it and to decrease the likelihood of racial profiling. And as mayor, I'm gonna to work to that. I'm gonna work with the experts and the BPD to evaluate our point system. You know, I wanna understand how we can limit our surveillance in certain communities. I wanna increase the diversity within the brick, but I think it's an important part because as someone who takes care of these people on the front lines, who's had to tell countless mothers and families that they've lost their young ones. Violence is a real thing, and I'm worried about the future of our city and this summer in particular. Uh, and so to be clear, would the gang unit stay or go? I think the, gang, the gang database stays. Um, and uh, Michelle, if you had the chance to answer this question, uh, City Council, uh, all right, same question to you then. Thank you. This would be, an a decision that as mayor, I would lean heavily on our new police commissioner to work in partnership uh, with community members and with our officers to deep dive and explore changes. We need to be open to thinking about a new structure to accommodate the type of shift that we wanna see in building relationships and trust back with our residents. The way that I see our job, especially as mayor, especially in an executive role where your job is not just to talk about issues, but to get them done and deliver. Our responsibility includes not only policymaking, 
not only budgets and programs, but getting the organizational structure right. This is a huge part of what morale looks like. This is a huge part of how effective we are delivering services. And this is also a huge part of the funding and how overtime is given out. And so we do need to explore changes here. This should be done in partnership under the leadership of a, a new commissioner with a, a search and a vetting process and all the, all the pieces we've been talking about who would be able to help set that new direction for the organization and ensure that it matches the daily reality of those who are on the ground and those in our community. Uh, so would the gang unit stay or go? I am open to change and I'll make sure that this is part of the um, set of op the set of changes that we are exploring in, in partnership with our new police commissioner. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the next question is from the firefighters. Um, they want to know, um, as mayor, would you commit to keeping pay and benefits parity between police and fire? Um, I believe uh, Councillor Sabi George takes this one first. Yeah, thank you for the question. And I'm uh, grateful to the service of our Boston firefighters across our city every single day, putting themselves at risk. And something that I've talked a great deal about with our firefighters, with our police officers, with our EMTs and paramedics is the importance of pay parity and the importance of mental health and physical health parity. I've led on that work on the Boston City Council and will continue to lead on that work as mayor. Pay parity also should extend to those doing the work. And when we think about our first responder agencies, those that are servicing and supporting the work of our firefighters, those that are supporting the work of our police officers and those that are supporting the work of our EMTs and paramedics within those uh, job units, those um, positions, there should also be pay parity. When we think about those that are fixing our fire trucks or our police cars or our ambulances, there needs to be pay parity extended beyond those. I think across the board, when we think about EMS, when we think about fire, when we think about police, we need to make sure that those three legs of both public safety and public health have equal footing, pay parity, and access to uh, parity across all benefits. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, now to the same question to Representative Santiago. Uh, the short answer is yes. I mean, pay parity is crucial to first responders. Again, I know the work they do. I mean, just this past weekend, I took care of a number of people who were uh, involved in motor vehicle accidents and the first responders, the fire department was literally pulling people, extricating them out of their cars. They do incredible work. They're important players in keeping people alive and safe. And so the short answer is yes. Thank you very much. Uh, same counts, same question to Councillor Wu. Yes, that would be a goal of mine as well. And I'll just keep it short and sweet. Very good. Thank you. Um, same and the same question to Mr. Barros. Thank you, Sean. The, the, the answer is yes, but I do want to take this opportunity to thank our firefighters for their work, uh, for what you guys do in the community. Uh, and many times you guys are first on the scene. I'm always impressed with uh, with that because you got the heaviest equipment to to, to lug. But I also want to thank you for being at a at a small graduation today, um, showing up and um, congratulating our kids at uh, at a moving on ceremony at St. John Paul in the Ponset. Um, it was an amazing ceremony. It, it made their day. And my son is still beaming today. He might be talking about being a firefighter now when he grows up. But thank you for the work that you do um, in keeping us safe. And thank you for the work you do in the community. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next question um, uh, comes from the, I think in a similar vein, this, this one comes from the EMS union. Um, a similar question, EMS, uh, the pay and benefits are lower. Um, would you, they want to know, would you work towards pay parity um, with the other first responder organizations? Uh, this start, this one starts with uh, Representative Santiago. Again, uh, I think we discussed this <clears throat> a couple of questions ago. The answer is yes. I know the important work they do. I mean, beyond that, I want to move our EMS to the 21st century. I've been working with those men and women for the past six, seven years. They are smart. They're capable. They're resourceful. We need to be giving them the tools to make our EMS, you know, the first in the country, just the best. And there are so many opportunities that abound here with substance use issues, 
uh, mental health issues, creating innovative mechanisms to, to allow them to live up to their potential. And I think about COVID-19, you know, I mean, they should have been out there, you know, if I was the mayor, they testing and providing vaccinations on day one. And so looking forward to working closely with them to, you know, increase their capabilities, to facilitate their response time, and to make sure that they get pay parity as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, same question to Councillor Wu. Yes, we are all deeply indebted and, and grateful for their work on a day-to-day -day basis, their work intensifying with so many of the challenges across our city, every major crisis that Boston is facing. Our EMS are on the scene along with other first responders, uh, making sure that we are um, as a city able to first see what is happening, provide services, and then feed that back into the larger push for systemic change. And so I would certainly be pushing for, you know, again, as discussed earlier, the facilities to be there, to be able to have that connection and that service available for residents across every single neighborhood without worry, to keep pushing our large institutions to do their share, and then as a city to strive for parity um, and ensure that we are not forgetting our, our EMS uh, as we're centering first responders. Incredibly important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, same question to Mr. Barrows. Thank you. Yes, the, the answer is yes. Uh, uh, our EMS uh, team is incredibly, uh, incredibly important. Um, in fact, I want to salute our chief, Huli, um, who does an amazing job. I want to thank him for working with me as chief of economic development to create more diversity on the force um, through our program called Boston Hire. As we trained people in the city of Boston to, to become EMTs, right, to, to join the, 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 the force. I want to thank you for um, continuing to be um, a great partner to the community. The answer is yes. We have to treat them with parity, both in terms of uh, pay and benefits. Thank you. And uh, to Councilor Asabi George. So it seems that we're all on the same page here, which is great when we think about the future of our city and we think about the very important role Boston EMS plays in that future. The one piece I would add when we talk about parity, both pay parity and access to opportunity parity is also the parity around independence. Boston EMS should be a third independent leg when we think of the work of our, our first responder uh, services. We think about police, we think about fire, we need to think about EMS in the very same way. They have to have a full seat at the table and the ability to do their work in a very independent way. And we have to create opportunities for Boston EMS to engage with those other agencies in a, a way that best serves and supports our city's residents, especially in their time of crisis. They should be very much involved in co-response, very much involved in more proactive response or proactive work to support our residents in their time of need and before their time of need. We've seen the commitment they have, have had in the city for generations, but certainly over this last year and a half. The impact of COVID on our city was felt, I think, very clearly by Boston EMS and, and the care that they continue to give over the course of uh, this pandemic. So I look forward as mayor to making that happen. I am committed to making that happen and look forward to uh, that work in partnership with Boston EMS in particular, but all of our first responder agencies. Thank you very much. Uh, this next question is from the Patrolman's Association. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about police overtime, uh, including already in, in this forum. Um, with a focus on overruns, what would be your plan for getting Boston police overtime spending down? Uh, I believe this one starts with Councillor Wu. Thank you, Sean. This is a major part of building back that trust with residents because it directly impacts not just the budget of this department, but resources, taxpayer dollars from all departments um, are being impacted by the increasing very rapidly growing um, overtime costs. And so we know that, as mentioned earlier, when you just slash the budget line item without any plans for how to actually change the underlying need and deployment of overtime hours, it doesn't result in any change. And in fact, it sets up the city, the sets up the city to overspend and again, reinforce those cycles of breaking trust with our residents. And so we need a real plan. 
as I, as I mentioned, that starts with embedding into our contract negotiations some changes. And we need to be honest about how certain categories of overtime need reforms. With court overtime, more than 50% of the hours paid out are hours that are not worked. That has to be front and center in the conversation about how we do better as a city of using our resources. And we also need to ensure, again, that we're looking at roles where within the department there are sworn officers performing tasks that we could supplement with civilians to ensure that we are freeing up um, those who are already on the force to be able to serve our residents in a different way. Uh, this is an issue where we have to be accountable across the board. Our city workers deserve a tremendous amount of gratitude and, and praise and, and recognition for the work that they put in. We are also held to higher standards for, for transparency and accountability across the board. We cannot have instances of overtime fraud. It is unacceptable that that news item has been in the public conversation and in the minds of residents questioning where their taxpayer dollars are going. So we need to have plans down to the level of day by day, month by month, how are we making a plan for what overtime is going to be used in which categories? And how do we ensure that that aligns with the high standards that we set for city workers across the board? Thank you. Uh, the same question to Mr. Barrows. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. The, the, we have to work together on overtime and make sure that um, the system's better, the system's more efficient. And in fact, we don't have um, areas where um, we are paying and, and um, actually not, you know, no one's showing up, right? We're not doing it. And so um, there's a lot of cleanup work to do. There's a lot that we can do there. Uh, but part of this is also answered by, um, you know, having a larger force. Um, we, we, we've seen over time grow with the growth in the population and the decrease in the force. Um, when I say there's 1,600 on the force now, there's 1,600 active. I think there's more than 16. It might be like 18, 19, or even 2,000 on the force now. But there's 16 active, and, and there's a big bubble of people who are leaving. I've been in rooms as part of the Walsh administration where you have, um, and it's really interesting, you have politicians arguing with the mayor and saying, we need to cut overtime. And in the next sentence, there's too much fireworks. I need more police on, on, in my neighborhood, in my district, because there's too much fireworks in my district. We've got to understand that if the police are called, they're going to show up. And so a part of this is real. Demand and shortage of, of, of police officers, we've got to respond to that. But, but let's be honest, there's a part of this that we have, to, we have to clean up and we've got to create some efficiencies. So in fact, when we do have overtime and we do have uh, overrun in budgets, that people know that it's because of the needs and it's not because of the inefficiencies. Uh, thank you. Uh, the same question to uh, Councilor Asabi George. Thank you for that question. And I want to note as we work to sort of wrap up today's forum, but also in response to this question, I want to note that our first responders, our police officers, our firefighters, our Boston EMTs and paramedics are essential workers. And I'm so grateful for their service over this last year to our city. And when we think about overtime, overtime needs to be viewed as the exception rather than the rule. We need to right size our department so that when we have overtime, it is just that, the exception to the rule. We need to make sure that we have appropriate staffing levels across our city to make sure that we have a safe city. And we need to properly plan for large scale events. Those are the ways that we uh, curb overtime spending and it's a great deal of overtime spending, but it is about making sure the force is appropriately staffed. Thank you very much. Uh, the same question to uh, Representative Santiago. Um, thanks, Sean. Um, look, our overtime budget um, has been increasing um, because we ask too much for officers. You know, we expect them to be everywhere all the time at a moment's notice. You know, and in order to fulfill that, we simply just need more officers. You know, so much so that I think the BPD overtime budget is expected to be upwards of $15 million over budget, you know? And so how do we come back on overtime? You know, first we need to reduce the reliance on officers, you know? We need to focus, making sure that other agencies are responding to incidents that don't require officers to be there. You know, we, secondly, we need to hire more officers. 
Thirdly, we, I think we need to set minimum staffing standards based on data and science, uh, which is not the case right now. Um, and fourth, you know, I think we need to reevaluate our medical leave policy so that we can get officers back to the job as soon as possible. But let me make it clear, you know, we need to eliminate any uh, illegal or unethical abuse of overtime by officers. It is wholly unacceptable um, that it happens. It puts a stain on the police department, on the good, soul, on the good cops um, doing their jobs right. And so under my administration, um, that will be um, absolutely unacceptable and people will be held accountable. Thank you very much. Just uh, as we wrap up here, um, so this forum is again hosted by the, the various uh, public safety unions. Um, if each of you could just take one minute, we'll start at the top with Mr. Barros again, go down alphabetically. Uh, just take one minute to say, why should these first responders vote for you? Um, Mr. Barros, go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot. First, I just want to thank again um, all of the uh, the unions that have come together and the, the different uh, first responders that have come together to put this on. Uh, you should vote for me because, in fact, I have the experience, um, the executive experience, leadership experience, public service experience to work with you and make sure that Boston continues to be a city with a high quality of life that respects all of our workers, that respects all of our city departments, and that has a vision for the best of our departments and the best of our city and has a track record of implementing. I, as a community organizer, have a track record of working with, with police, working with police to try to get the diversity, doing recruitment, working put, with police to make sure that we have um, um, the right partnerships on the ground, uh, the right understanding of what's happening in our community, that we're doing outreach to community members, that we're doing outreach to youth, and that the police is able to do their job. In that kind of scenario, the police are effective. As mayor, I will try to put you in a position to succeed. My vision is to have the safest city, but not because we're putting police officers in places to fail. Because in fact, we have trained professionals that are out there to help you. Because we have trained social workers in our schools. We have guidance counselors in our schools that are there to help our students when our students need it. That we have community partnerships on the ground that are there to help you and help you by making sure that our young people are doing the right things, that they are um, 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 not um, uh, people that you're coming up against. We have to run that's, that's, that's been uh, one minute, if you could just wrap up quickly. All right, no, I, I appreciate that, Sean. You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta keep me in line here because I got excited. Um, but I, I, I am excited to, to be mayor. I believe I've got the experience and I will hit the ground running and look forward to partnering with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, to you, Councilor Sabi George. Boston is my home. I've built deep roots here and I'm grateful that my parents, immigrants to this country, made this place their home. This connection drives me to work harder and deliver more for the city that I love. I'm a former Boston public school teacher. I'm a small business owner. I'm the mother of four teenage boys and a city councilor at large representing the entire city, representing all of you. I believe I'm the right leader for this moment, this city. I believe that this city can be both safe and just. I will ensure as mayor of this city that we have a public safety system that re responds to the needs of Boston's residents and visitors, that we, that we can have a professional public safety system that works to prevent crimes and respond to incidents of violence, care for the sick, injured and those in need and limit the impacts of fire, disaster and devastation. Boston can be healthy, safe, and just. These things are not mutually exclusive. To do that, we have to be willing to work with each other to get it done. And as your mayor, I am committed to that partnership with you, the people of Boston, and those that work every day to keep us safe. I'm grateful for this time this evening and look forward to future partnership. Thank you very much. And uh, Representative Santiago. Great. Um, thank you again to all the first responders out there for what you do day in and day out. Look, uh, the city's in crisis, you know, and it needs a leader um, who knows a thing or two about crisis management. You know, I, you know, I look around the city and whether it's housing, the schools, the polarization that is poisoning our, our state and our city, you know, it's making things quite challenging. COVID has made it all worse. And to me, the only way that we're going to get out of this mess is with strong public leadership. And that's something I've exhibited my entire life. 
you know, as a captain in the army, as a state representative, and as an emergency room doctor. And I've done this by bringing people together to solve complex issues. You know, if I don't exhibit crisis leadership in the ER, people die. If I don't exhibit leadership in the army, my soldiers are at risk. You know, there's a dearth of leadership at City Hall. And I got in this race to provide that. You know, you need someone who understands your line of work, who speaks your language, who's willing to work with you and have these tough conversations. I want to facilitate your success. I want to be a mayor who's going to have your back, who's going to be on the front lines with you when it comes to issues of public safety, substance use, and everything else. And so you know, I thank you for the conversation today. I look forward to having many more with you so we can learn to you know, get, uh, get across the aisle and deal with these important issues that need to be dealt with sooner than later, because I'm very much worried about this summer and where our city's headed. Thank you very much. And uh, to wrap things up, Councillor Wu. Thank you, Sean, and thank you to everyone for putting this together. I am grateful for the work that you do, the life-saving heroic work that you have put in throughout the pandemic and long before. My life and my family's life has been touched and impacted by your work across each of our three first responder groups. And I just want to be here to say I'm here to seek your support. I'm here to listen and to be a partner in the work in delivering a safe, healthy, and prosperous city for everyone. And regardless of whether or not you vote for me, I will be fighting for you and your families because we've talked about a lot of issues specific to public safety and your day jobs today. You are also members of communities that need access to clean air and clean water and good jobs. You're part of families who need affordable housing and good schools for your kids. I'm, I'm pushing for a vision of Boston for everyone, where each person, each family will have a role in making sure that we have the entirety of what we need as a city. We have all of that. We just need everyone's voice in the process. So very respectfully and humbly ask for your vote. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, we will end. Again, this has been hosted by the various public safety unions. That's the Boston Police Patrolmen's Association, Boston Fire, the EMS Division of the Patrolmen's Association, the Police Superior Officers Federation, Police Detectives Benevolent Society, and MAMLEO. And a big thank you to the counts, to the candidates who attended. Uh, that was uh, John Barros, John Santiago, Anissa Sabi George, and Michelle Wu. Uh, thank you all very much, and have a good night. Good night.